Welcome everyone and happy new year. Uh, today the panel will be discussing what has come to be known as divorce day among the family law community due to the notable surge in inquiries in the first week of January following the winter holidays. But before we get into the content of our presentation, I'm just going to take a few minutes to go over the agenda and introduce our speakers who are all lawyers at our firm, Russell Alexander Collaborative Family Lawyers. So what you can expect to be covered in the next hour are the following topics. What is divorce day and why January each year? The difference between separation and divorce, common law, living separate and apart under the same roof, the importance of date of separation, cooling off periods in the Divorce Act, what are possible financial scenarios for the matrimonial home? This can be scary, what happens next? Kitchen table agreements, disclosure and ILA, quick tips and counseling services. The panelists will also be fielding audience questions throughout the presentation and we'll re reserve a few minutes at the end of the presentation for Q&A as well. And as always, this presentation is not intended to provide legal advice, but rather provide general information on divorce and separation. So we please ask that you just keep this in mind as you listen and submit your questions. So now it is time to introduce our panel. Firstly, we have Michelle Mulchin, who is the senior managing lawyer at our firm. She's been practicing family law for over 13 years and is skilled in all areas of family law. Her focus is on creating comprehensive, creative resolutions to family law matters, and Michelle excels at helping clients deal with complex financial issues that arise as a result of separation. Next, we have Carolyn Warner, and Carolyn is a fully trained collaborative family lawyer who has a knack for developing creative resolutions unique to each client situation. Carolyn has been practicing family law exclusively for over 10 years since her call to the bar in 2011. She is committed to providing her clients with empathy and sound advice and prides herself on approaching all cases with an analytic, analytical and tenacious mindset. Next, we have Annie Ektayan, and Annie has been a family lawyer for over 10 years, and her practice includes litigation, alternative dispute resolution, such as mediation and or arbitration, and where appropriate collaborative practice in which she is certified. As a family lawyer, Annie's priority is understanding her client's objectives, looking out for their interests and guiding them through the process, whichever route their particular matter takes. Her advice to her clients is practical and informed by professional experience and the knowledge she has gained over the last decade of practicing family law. And then last, but certainly not least, we have Russell Alexander, who is the founder and senior partner of our firm. With over 24 years of experience, Russell offers a wealth of knowledge and expertise in collaborative family law uses his, his experience with a client-focused approach by creating unique solutions for each of his clients to enable them and their families to move forward with their lives in a compassionate and collaborative manner. And now it is my pleasure to pass things over to Russell. Thank you for those kind words, Shannon. We really put together quite the dream team for today's presentation. I wanna thank everybody for uh, giving us their time. So let's make a start with our first poll. All right, so tell us a little bit about yourself. And I'm gonna take a question uh, while we give everybody a few minutes to answer this poll question that came in from our audience in advance. This question is, can a petitioner be self-represented in divorce? So here's a nice lob ball to get us started. Who wants to take this one on? Annie, I see you got a big smile on your face. What's the answer to this one? The answer is yes, but it is not advisable, is what I would say. Uh, there is certainly nothing uh, stopping an individual from um, filing for a divorce for him or herself. Um, but as with anything that involves uh, application under legislation, I would always suggest that you at least in the at the very least in the background confer with counsel about it. Um, and that is because a lot of what we're going to go over in the next hour or so will explain why uh, that's so important. So yes, the official answer is yes, you certainly can act for yourself. You don't have to have an, you know, legal representative. But it is a it can be quite complex and divorces and separations intersect with a lot of other areas of law. And so it's always good to at least have the guidance, if not the on the record representation of a legal professional to help you. Sort of like bungee jumping without a cord. I would rather bungee jump without a cord, but show up in certain before certain judges without uh, a legal professional. Yeah. 
Good, good call. Thank you for that. All right, let's see what our audience is comprised of today and take a look at our poll results. Thank you, everybody, for asking. So a family lawyer, legal professional, 43%. Lawyer or law professional in another area, law, 23%. Professional in another area, field, 14%. Going through a separation or divorce, 14%. We have three law students with us today. Welcome, 4%. And one other, you can put it in the Q&A box. So thank you for answering those poll questions for us. So why? what is Divorce Day and why January? Michelle, why, is this isn't some gimmick. This is something we're experiencing, right? Absolutely. And actually, we see it every year. I've been doing this for over 13 years now, and it, it never fails to surprise me just how many people we get coming to us in January. And in conversing with my clients, I've actually heard a number of reasons as to why January. So just a few of the um, you know more prevalent ones are, one, to get through another Christmas. So you know Christmas is a big time. It's something I know my family and my kids really enjoy. And it's a big thing every year. So a lot of people want to give the kids one last Christmas together as a family before they throw the children into this new world, into, you know, multiple households and, and all of the strife that comes with that. Um, also, I'm sure it doesn't help the kids are off for two weeks. So it might be one of those things that people don't want to have a particularly difficult two weeks off when you have little ones running around and little ones who can hear arguments and things like that. So I think a lot of people put on a brave face and just, if they can, try to get through the holidays before they start proceedings. Um, as we know, financial issues are one of the most um, prevalent reasons why people get separated. So I have heard of people who say that, you know, they see the credit card bills, they see the spending that has happened over the holidays, or maybe they just look at the finances and realize that things are not going the way that they thought it was going. Um, also extended family and disputes over the holidays. While the holidays are a great time, it's also a very difficult time and it can be triggering for a lot of people, especially when you have third parties, which are family um, involvement. I actually just had a call with a client yesterday and you know, uh, he said that he felt like he was married to two people, uh, his ex-wife and the mom, because they were both uh, both giving him grief. So I, I, I felt so you badly see, for him. You see the mother-in-laws or the father-in-laws over the holidays too, right? It's sort of like an incubator there, right? Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, you know, and then some people, a lot of us start New Year traditions or resolutions. And so some people decide that, as their resolution, maybe they're getting out of an abusive relationship, maybe they're getting out of a loveless marriage, you know, um, maybe things have just changed, and, and that's fine too. And of course, the biggie, the, the last one we see often is that one of the, one or more of the spouses have repartnered and the other person has found out. So it's time to, to move forward and to start afresh. And um, quite often, these things happen over the holidays because you're home more often, your phone's around, um, people see messages pop up. So quite unfortunate that these things do happen as well. Yeah, Anybody else? Anyone here? Any other fun reasons that they'd there, like to share? There's certainly an ebb and flow to family law, right? You know, back to school is always business busy. I, I'd, I'd just add that, you know, a lot of lawyers close. Um Mm -hmm. offices between Christmas and New Year's and courts kind of wind down a little bit too. So some people would just have difficulty accessing the justice system is another reason why we see a bit of a bump. What do you think, Carolyn or Annie? Any other reasons that you can think of? I had one uh, quite frequently is uh, when we're doing the equalization calculation. I have a lot of clients that just say that it's easier to do everything year end. Yeah. I guess the way the, finance, the banking statements come in. So I have a lot of people just say they want to start fresh January 1 and have a year-end separation date. That's a pr pretty clean date of separation, right? December 31st um, at midnight. But Annie, any thoughts? 
I think it's largely what Michelle touched on, which is that it's a bit of a pressure cooker situation where you have everybody, including out of town family coming in, you're spending a lot, people's offices are closed, you're spending a lot of time together. And I, I tend to think that people often want to get the process started earlier. But like Michelle said, they want to give the kids that one Christmas. And so they hold things together. And then perhaps, you know, have their New Year's resolution be that, OK, we've done the holiday. Now it's the time to, to get serious. That's what I, that's what the feedback has been from my clients in the past. And they'll wait a few months too, right? They'll be November, maybe October. And they say, well, let's get through Christmas or there could be yeah. other family milestones coming up. And they think, OK, well, we'll give the kids that one last happy memory, right? sort of exactly before they break it to them yeah really good point thank you for that michelle let's get into our next poll and what is the most common reason you believe relationships fail and spike in december so let's see what our audience thinks we've heard michelle provide us with some insight in terms of why we're seeing a spike another question that came in ahead of time uh, if someone commits adultery what are they entitled to in divorce? Now, this is a hot, this is always tough, right? Because we've got people who come into our office and they think, you know, they should be punished, right? For their conduct, you know, that bastard cheated on me or whatever the case is. But what's the effect of this, Carolyn? Yeah, and during consultations, I usually try and explain it in layman's terms and I put it in language that there's, we have a no fault system. Right. And I think that's an easy way for, um, you know, people to understand that um, that's not how our, our act operates here. And it doesn't really have an impact in terms of the way how property is divided or the way how uh, you divide the roles for parenting. But I do find that it often has an impact behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. And there's always that emotional layer and that component that always does come up um, in the process of, you know, negotiating the terms for an agreement. So it does um, have an impact behind the scenes, ultimately, and also in terms of trying to obtain a divorce under the act, um, there, the, you know, the standard is we have, you know, one year separation period, but there's that would be a ground to to get a divorce earlier than that one year point if you um, are able to um, show that there was adultery, though it doesn't always work in practice. <laughs> Logistically, it's administratively it might be hard to push that through within a year but Annie your thoughts I was the first to forget to unmute excellent <laughs> so um I I was going to agree with with that last point yeah administratively um it is it's no real advantage to claim adultery in a, in a divorce proceeding and, and like Carolyn said it you know because it impacts things behind the scenes it also makes it very messy if you're going to raise adultery as an issue um so you know I've had clients bring that up and I tell them well technically you could use that to bypass the one year however there are so many other claims that have to be dealt with before you get that divorce, as we'll, we'll touch on later in the presentation, that there's no real advantage to, to dealing with a divorce first, even if you could use the fact of, of adultery. So yeah, I agree entirely with what Carolyn said. There's, there's, you are not entitled to, gr to any greater um, settlement if you have been, you know, the victim of an adulterous uh, spouse, and you're not really going to be disentitled if you are the party who co committed adultery. So I usually tell people that it's moot. You could push the envelope too, though, right? If, if you can demonstrate there was some kind of reckless spending of family resources because of this relationship, or maybe they're in Vegas uh, gambling away. The, the kids RSPs or something. Maybe there's an argument there should be an adjustment for that. But I that, actually had that would go more towards a financial argument, not the adulterous yeah. conduct. Sorry, Michelle. Yeah. No, it's okay. I was going to say I actually had one where unfortunately the ex spouse was for a year taking multiple trips to Mexico and he was saying it was for business reasons. And it turns out that he had someone there and he had funneled thousands of dollars. You know, once you start going back in the um, credit cards and and bank receipts, you know, ten thousand dollars of people's jewelers, and you know, you'd have to go get the 
actual receipt from people's and you'd see it was diamond earrings or rings or whatever it is. So it, it, it's very rare though. I've seen it once. Yeah. If it's something reckless and you'd look at the spending, not necessarily the right. uh, emotional conduct. All right. Let's see what our audience thinks about our last poll question. Uh, finances, 49%. Certainly um, that's always a strain on families. Procrastination, 21% interaction with extended family. Uh, Michelle and I joked about that a little bit, 25%. Alcohol, 17%. Uh, spending more time together, 35%. We saw a lot of that during the pandemic. You know, people getting cabin fever and realizing uh, they don't like their spouse that much if it's going to be 14 hours a day. For other Q&A, put in the box. Thank you for audience for answering those questions. The difference between separation and divorce. So what do we need to know here, Annie? So it's a it's a very sort of broad question, and I'll, I'll attempt to narrow it by saying that a divorce is just that. It is the legal dissolution of your marriage and the point at which the state no longer recognizes you and your former spouse as spouses. The thing to keep in mind is that the divorce is ultimately the very last step in the process. You start with a separation. And the separation is the point at which the parties um, both are aware that the relationship has, for all intents and purposes, ended. So a lot of times what I'll hear from people when they come for consults is they will say, well, I want a legal separation, or how do I get a legal separation? And I have to explain to them that there's no such thing, that there is no uh, declaration by the state that you are separated in the way that there is when you are divorced. So the difference between those two is that for married individuals, when you are divorced, there are obligations and rights that terminate upon that divorce that do not terminate when you are separated. So the big thing to keep in mind is that your rights and your obligations when you're in that limbo period of separation, and here I'm talking about financial obligations towards the household, etc., those all continue until you get your legal resolution, which is the divorce. You are separated at the point at which you communicate to your spouse the intention to be separated. And then the two of you live in such a way that is what I'll identify as maybe a repudiation of the relationship. Okay. That's a separation. There's no contract you sign. You don't go get something notarized saying we agree that you, we are separated. It's simply when the two of you acknowledge that the relationship uh, has come to an end, but you are still legally yoked to one another. That's the big distinction between, I think Russ is laughing at my verbiage here, yep. uh, at the uh, <laughs> yoked to one another. Uh, I'm sure it's in the act somewhere. So you know, that's if, the if big you get a distinction. From a, if you get a letter from a lawyer, it's probably a pretty good idea that the relationship's not going too well either, right? Exactly. Any anything like that. I mean, those are those are the, um, the 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 only steps that need to really be taken for a separation because, unlike a divorce, you do, there are far fewer steps. It's really about intention, a separation. I'm talking here to be clear among married individuals. I'll talk later about common law relationships. So the divorce is what happens at the end after there has been a resolution of all of the issues from everything relating to, you know, um, um, issues of intestacy, issues of parenting, the financial issues, property issues. That's where the divorce happens and your marriage is actually dissolved legally and you're no longer regarded as married spouses. The separation is the limbo period that precedes all of that. And this is um, where oftentimes where um, individuals do all of the, with the help of counsel, one hopes, do all of the negotiation and just lay all of the groundwork for the resolution. So the, the separation is what I would say when all the work happens, the divorce is the end result after all the other pieces have been put into place. And intention isn't mutual. One person can decide the relationship's over. The other one may want to continue and look at marriage counseling. Yeah. That's not the test though, right? You don't need yeah. to agree on separating. Right. 
but you must, the intention must be known. I always say to people when I'm discussing to them a date of separation, I say to them, it can't have been a secret. You can't have been harboring a desire to have been separated from your wife, but never have told her and to have continued living together and going on vacation and hosting each other's families. It can't be a secret desire. It has to be a communicated desire. It does not have to be reciprocal, but it cannot be a secret. That is the point. There is no great act that comes that has to be committed to uh, to to indicate that you are separated, but it cannot be a secret. Send an email or text message confirming your conversation from last night, wherein you said the relationship was over. Right there's your paper. Trail. Absolutely, absolutely. And as cold as that sometimes sounds, I've I've you know I've said this to clients. I said put it in a writing. Have the conversation first, right? Have sit the person down and speak to them. Don't surprise them with a text message, but then send a quick text message. Send an email. Say as we discussed last night. I just want to confirm, you know, and then just so that uh, the other person in the future cannot claim that they were unaware that there was a separation. But you, you're exactly right. If you go on family holidays and pretend everything's great, you can't, I don't think, rely on that message from a year ago if you conducted yourself differently. Exactly. There has to be that repudiation of the relationship. On, the test ongoing in, repudiation. Ongoing. Right. Ongoing. And and that I mean, there I won't get into all of the factors that a court would look like, look at, but one of the things that I, I tell clients is how would somebody from the outside looking in at you and your partner, how would they perceive you to be separated? Or for all intents and purposes, do you continue to represent yourselves as a as a unit, as a, a married unit? Um, and that becomes relevant for the purposes of you know property separation, which we don't have to go into now. But that's that's what's what separation is. So it isn't signed a document that a lawyer prepares saying that we are separated. You're separated at the point at which you communicate that intention and you live accordingly. But a lawyer's letter is pretty strong evidence as well, Mary, if, oh. if you do go to that step. But let, let's do a poll because that was an excellent summary. Thank you. Um, living separate and apart, sorry. When is a couple considered common law in Ontario for the purposes of family law? Uh, give everybody a moment. I want to get back to some audience questions here. I, and I, we've passed adultery, but somebody's asked: Can you name a third? Can a third party be named uh, or added to the adultery uh, who committed it? Right? Again, probably not. We did see some cases a couple of years ago where I think they were arguing, you know, it was the tort of contractual interference that, that they're trying to bring in the new partner for some type of damages, but I would say no. I, I think the court would have very little patience for that. What do you guys think about that question? I yeah. think, sorry, go, go ahead, Michelle. I was just going to say family courts generally are um, there. I mean, you you can make tort claims at family law. Um, generally speaking, the monetary damages that are awarded for such claims tend to be modest and uh, not necessarily the output is not going to be worth the input financially that you put into that. And it all goes back to what what Carolyn said when she was talking about adultery, which is while it motivates you, you know, in the background as a claimant, it's not necessarily going to assist you in your proceeding. It's it's something that has upset you, but not necessarily something that puts you in a in a strong position um, in the in a legal context. Well, often the motivations, you know, vengeance or redemption, yeah. right? It's kind of, people they don't care about you know their legal budget at that point. But Michelle, what were you going to say? Oh, no, I completely agree with Annie. And remember, um, I like to tell my clients this early on, that about 1% of family cases actually ever go to a trial. So, you know, this isn't unfortunately like Matlock. We're not going to have a situation where a judge sits there and says, you, sir, you were the adulterer and you broke down the family and you're a terrible person. It, it really, unfortunately, just does not happen. And we have some wonderful services. We've got counseling services. I know one of you guys are going to talk about that later on, but um, I find it helps my clients better if I send them to the appropriate mental health services rather than them trying to get their revenge or their day in court because it just does not happen. Let's yeah. do a, I'm going to get to these survey results. Let's do a quick survey 
yes or no, just put the answer in the QA box. Now, many people know who Matt Lark is. <laughs> Am I aging myself here, guys? I don't know. Our audience, some of our audience haven't even seen what? Top Gun. It's like, what's going on? You haven't seen uh, Top Gun? What, what's a newer Ally McBeal? Is that, is that a oh newer? Okay, one? now, Michelle, Michelle. <laughs> now I got it. I got to throw Ally your life Mc, jacket Ally here. McBeal might have been before Matt Like, Come on. <laughs> okay, what hang other? on. Hang, go ahead. Hang on. Let's I, get uh, this pull off the screen here. When is the couple uh, considered common law in Ontario? I just want to give credit to the late, great Phil Epstein, when the toothbrush shows up was his comment, all right? If toothbrush is there, probably a good chance you're common law. Uh, children are together, 5%, live together for one year or more, 31%, live together for three years, plus 32%. Obviously, a sophisticated audience choosing, to, it depends at 32%. That's usually our default answer to everything. Um, sorry, what were you going to say before I cut you off there, Annie? Oh, just to go back to adultery uh, for a second. Um, one thing I, I, I would say is- Let's talk about in, adultery for now. Yeah, let's talk about <laughs> adultery now. Well, one thing to keep in mind is if there are children uh, of the relationship um, and the individual who um, was the, let's say, the, the person that the spouse had an affair with is still in the life of, of that spouse um, and there are children children and children have been introduced to this person and they're, you know, they're, it becomes a real relationship for one of the parents. One thing that, you know, parties should be mindful of is the treatment of that individual as part of the, the court proceeding, because this is somebody who could potentially be a step parent to the children. This is somebody who is going to be in the lives of the children. And so as angry as somebody might be at the person that their spouse cheated on them with, if this becomes an actual relationship and this person is going to be in the lives of the children, um, you're, you do a disservice, I think, to the children if you let, um, if you let that infect the, the family law process. That's a really good way to poison the waters. And I've unfortunately seen it happen. So that's something that I would, I would also say is a reason to not lean too heavily on the adultery uh, claim in a family law proceeding. I've got a very important update from our audience. Uh, yes to Matlock. Yes, I know Matlock. Matlock was great. Yes, they know Matlock and they know Allie McBill. So thank you, everyone. I appreciate it. <laughs> maybe I'm being too hard on you, Michelle, but if you've got other TV shows uh, in the same vein, put them in the chat Q&A. We'll get to them. Common law separation. Back to you, Annie. What do we need to know here? Sure thing. So the uh, key que uh, term in that poll question, that last poll question was for family law purposes. When are you common law for family law purposes? And the reason is it's different than being common law for the purposes of the Canada Revenue Agency. So if you are cohabiting in a conjugal relationship with another individual for one year, you can file your taxes as common law and you're not doing anything improper. You're not doing anything inadvisable. For the purposes of CRA, you are common law. For the purposes of making a family law claim, you are not. So for a family law claim, you have to be cohabiting in a conjugal relationship for three years. There is an exception. I'll get to that in a moment. So it is the three-year period to make a claim of, for example, spousal support or something like that. The exception that I alluded to earlier would be if there is a child of the relationship, uh, whether it's a child that you adopt or child uh, born sort of uh, as children are in the course of a relationship, then it would be a cohabitation of a conjugal relationship for one year. OK, so as ever, the it depends would have been the, uh, the correct answer to, to that poll. So a common law separation, um, it, of course, you know, the the obvious distinction is, well, there's no divorce at the end of the road. However, there are still legal claims that have to be resolved when common law partners separate, especially if you have children. So if there is a separation between common law partners, oftentimes a separation agreement should still be drafted and still be executed, dealing with the individual's rights, dealing with parenting issues, dealing with issues of child support, etc. So if you are common law, the big distinction is that you do not have any automatic property rights. 
the equalization scheme in the Family Law Act of Part 1 does not apply to you. However, there is legislation that deals with child support and with spousal support and with parenting and with decision making. And all of those issues have to be addressed as part of a common law separation. So just because you weren't, you don't need to go to a court for the dissolution legally of the relationship, but you can absolutely and should absolutely get your ducks in a row with respect to spousal support, child support, uh, the re rearing of the children in terms of decision making and the parenting schedule, but no automatic property rights. All right. Thank you for that. Let's get into our next poll question, the grounds for divorce. I'm going to throw that up on the screen. Thank you, everybody, for participating in our polls. One suggestion was suits might be more timely for a TV show. Uh, I don't. My actually... husband loves suits, but I've never watched it. And I have a client right now whose son watches it all the time and has told me we actually had dinner together over Christmas and uh, has told me I need to watch it. So thank you. I will put it on my list. I think a lot of it's filmed in Toronto. So it uh, is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And Meghan Markle was actually one of the um, uh, the actors in that. She and was great. Um, yeah. And I, I've always told everyone Meghan Markle is kind of my style icon. It's, it's she's kind of the person I I enjoy seeing how she dresses and what she's wearing. So I should really watch it. Yeah. Okay. And there's a neat part of it in the, her documentary about filming on the scene of suits and how they, she needed increased security after she started dating the prince. But okay, question, question from our audience: um, Would you be? Would you consider partners to be separated if they are physically separate, different rooms, or separate addresses, but continue to date or have booty calls with one another for a number of years? So, Sorry, did you say separate addresses or just separate, separate rooms? Separate rooms or separate addresses, but I guess mm -hmm. there's still, I guess, friends with privileges or whatever they call it these days. Um, well, so does the booty call reset the clock on the state of separation? I don't know. Well, don't the, we're going to say it. It depends. Yeah, it it, <laughs> it depends. The, the the case law. I mean, again, there's the big thing to keep in mind is that there's no one factor that uh, a court will prioritize over the others. But ongoing sexual congress, I'll say, if that doesn't sound too formal. Congress. Uncle, if she can reference Matlock, I can say sexual congress. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> uh, I think, Andy, your terms are a little even older than mine. What was it? I, don't know, it, I, don't know, I, I still don't understand the yolk thing. <laughs> All right, so there's a congress going on. How's that? Yeah, so if, if, they, if, they continue, if they continue to, to have sex, that is one factor that a court will uh, consider, but it's not dispositive. So it's not determinative. Yeah. It's the totality of their conduct. So the clock isn't reset, but somebody could certainly use that to say, well, she was still sleeping with me. So I didn't think we were broken up. I thought we had reconciled. So, so I would the, say it's iffy. The booty call once or twice a year may not reset the clock if all the other is yeah. repudiation. Right. Especially different addresses, right? If you're at a different address, but by yeah. maybe once or twice a year, things get a little bit frisky. Um, I, I don't think that would do it. But again, totality, as Andy said. All right. yeah. Let's see what our audience thinks. Um, living separate and apart, 88%. Well, that's usually, you know, most of, I don't think, I think just about 99% of our cases, we take off that box, right? Yeah. Uh, irreconcilable differences, well, that's the reason 40%, cruelty, 59%, adultery, 58%. Um, Refusal to do the dishes or vacuum, 4%. Who put that in there? A lot of these kind of blend in together, right? It could be the irreconcilable differences, the cruelty, but just as a matter of practice, if you've been yeah. separate and apart, click that box. You don't have to prove the other elements to get your divorce. Would you guys agree on that? Yeah, and it goes back to it. Care Sorry, go ahead. No, I was just saying, I think that's the safest way to go. Um, Somehow I got talked into doing a divorce uh, based on adultery and it was in the midst of the pandemic. <laughs> and every time the court would come back and they would ask for more information and more information and against my advice, we proceeded with that. And by the time the process had completed, a year had passed and I came back and said, 
well, I told you this was going to happen. <laughs> we want to more, de point, more let's details. Let's just proceed on living separate apart for a year. And we, we did end up getting the divorce. We wanted um, more details about the adultery. Uh, yes. <laughs> and yeah. And we had affidavits with the name, um, the, uh, the spouse even prepared an affidavit that wasn't sufficient for the court. So from experience, just go with living separate apart for a year. And what a yeah. terrible experience for the, you know, those parties, for if there are children involved, you know, to have to rehash all of that, to, to now provide receipts, uh, you know, it, it's just, it's so sad. I think it's such a and, sad and thing. And legal expense too. I'm going to say this with my fingers crossed. One last audience question about adultery. Um, what if a spouse who spent 130000 on prostitutes, I guess the sex addiction maybe, with the, uh, the other spouses knowing, are they entitled to get the money back? So maybe this came off a line of credit or something. I would say that probably goes to the reckless depletion of assets. I don't know what you guys think. Any thoughts? Yeah, that would, my first thought is that would be a claim for unequal division of the net family properties uh, for the reason that Russ just uh, identified, which is reckless depletion of, of assets. So keep in mind that the reason that that person went into debt, you know, what, that it was, you know, it went towards paying for a sex addiction or, or whatever is not necessarily going to be as germane as the fact that there was, you know, a, a, a unilateral withdrawal from, let's say, a line of credit by by one person. You need to flush out the yeah. evidence, right? And show yeah. that it's actually going to prostitutes, not crypto yeah. or some other bad investment. <laughs> And I think yeah. the length of time, right? If this has been going on for 10 years, it might be harder to make that argument or at least go back as far as 10 years. But if you've taken out 130,000 in a couple of months, then I think that would be a, a bit easier to show as well. Right. Yeah. All right. Let's talk about living separate and apart and in the same roof. Michelle, thoughts here? How many minutes do I have for this, Russ? We are going. <laughs> well, enough, we might have spent a little bit too much time on the salacious stuff, but I don't know. We'll. We'll see how we're coming. Maybe. All tight, right. But... So we need to do a whole seminar on, on adultery, apparently. Right. OK, so. Um, yeah, so living separate and apart under the same roof, this happens all the time. And lots of my clients come in and they've done this without even knowing it. So when parties separate, you know, we, we will talk about the date of separation, but we pick a date and we say, OK, that's the date that we separate everything. But it's not magic. You know, you can't simply divide your assets, sell your home, figure out where the kids are going to be. It takes time. And so for many couples, I would say most couples, there is, unless there's domestic violence, there is usually this uh, situation where you're living separate and apart in the same home. And it can look, you know, there are many different ways to do this. So usually parties are in separate bedrooms. Um, you know, sometimes they are sharing the domestic work. Sometimes they're doing it together. Um, it, you know, it, it really is dependent on your particular family and you can make this work however it works for you. I've had some people who work shift work and so they literally wouldn't really even be in the house at the same time, except for maybe on days off. And they'd kind of just come in, take care of the kids during their parenting time and then go off to work. So as I said, though, if it's a domestic violence situation, this is not a great idea. And if I were the lawyer speaking to the person who had either been accused or who was accusing the other party of domestic violence, I wouldn't suggest a living separate and apart under the same roof scenario. Uh, we can have nesting arrangements where, where, you know, there's dedicated times where parties go in and out, or usually one party will move out, especially if they've got family or a way to do so that's safe and ensure that there can be no other allegations made. All right. Um, quick question came in here. Couples living separate and apart. All right, sorry. The people want to know common law couples and the different trust claims. Shannon will put a link into it. We have separate um, programs dealing with you know, constructive resulting trust, joint family ventures. We'll give you some additional information on that. We can't cover that today. But quickly, Michelle, the importance of the data separation. We've got a few minutes. Let's start off with. Oh, thanks. Um, so data separation. So as I alluded to, the data separation is very, very important. So um, this is the date that all of your, um, that kind of triggers everything. So 
post-separation date adjustments, equalization if you're married, uh, child support, spousal support. It's a very important date. And if you think about it kind of critically, let's say we just chose a week. Let's say we chose the first week in January, for instance. Well, what day do we choose? Our checking accounts are going to change on a day-to-day basis, you know, January 1st versus January 7th. Maybe you've had a paycheck come in in there. Uh, Maybe transfers were made between accounts. Maybe you had a mortgage payment in there. So instead, what we do is we choose one particular day, and that's the day that we use to um, divide everything. Can everyone hear me okay? Oh, thanks. Yes. Yeah, I can hear you. I think Annie needs to maybe mute while we're waiting. Go ahead, Michelle. Of course. Thank you. I just wanted to make sure I wasn't um, talking on and no one could hear me. So as we talked about, you don't often go backwards from the state. You can if there are issues, but um, usually this is the date that everything gets divided from, from going forward. And often parties can't agree on what the date of separation is. So as a practical point, what we sometimes do as family lawyers is we have both parties do two separate financial statements, and then we pull two NFPs. It's unfortunately twice the work, but often you'll find that the two different dates may or may not have made a big difference. And if it does make a big difference, then unfortunately, you're going to be going to a court, either a uh, motion or um, a bifurcated trial to determine that issue because None of the equalization or and a lot of the financial issues cannot be determined until we have the data separation. And again, it's all fact-based. It's all dependent on what happened with that couple and why each party thinks their particular data separation is important and you know what evidence you have to support that. When I come across those scenarios, usually they're within 10 or 12, 20 grand, right? Unless there's been huge changes in the market. You're going to spend that on legal fees in any event, cut it in the middle because the evidence you're going to need to prove the two different dates is going to be cost you more than you're going to get. Would you agree with that, Michelle? Oh, absolutely. A bifurcated trial alone could be 20,000 per party. And if you're that close, you know, if you've done the two NFPs and you're about 20,000 apart, I think any resolution focused lawyer would say, you know, is it worth spending 20 grand to gain 10? And you only get a de- decision on one issue in that trial, then you come back for the other trial dates, right? So it's- Oh, absolutely. And, and you're really doubling your legal work because while you're trying to determine that first critical issue of data separation, there's a lot of other things that can't be determined, like retroactive child support, retroactive spousal support. Okay. Suits was filmed at the Bay Adelaide Center, if anybody's wondering, according to our audience member. Thank you for that. Cooling off periods quickly, Uh, Michelle, what do we need to know here? All right, so super quickly, um, we talked about it throughout this presentation. Uh, One year before you can get divorced, really historically, it was so that parties can make sure that they really wanted to get separated. Practically, it takes probably about a year to finalize everything. So as, you know, Carolyn alluded to, it's probably just best to wait for the one year. if you have a home, it takes time to sell it. If you've got children, it may, it may take time to determine what's going to happen to them, You know where they're going to live. That may be dependent on where each party either buys or rents a new house. So usually that, that one year period is um, it's used up and, and it's, it goes really quickly. But again, it's important. This is for married couples only. Common law couples do not fall under the divorce act. All right, let's run our next poll. When spouses separate, they each get half of the house. We'll let that run for a minute. Um, while we're doing this, we'll get into our next topic. What are the possible financial scenarios for the matrimonial home? Carolyn, what do, you, what do we need to know here in a couple minutes or less? Yeah, I've got that one, thanks. So when looking at the matrimonial home, um, there's a few options that can be considered. Most often people think about sale, but that's not really the only option. Um, sometimes what I will have clients do is arrange <clears throat> what we call a um, nesting arrangement. So that may be where one um, spouse l- remains in the home and you have them rotating in and out and the children also remain in the home. And it's sort of called that nesting for that reason. Um, Usually when we have that sort of arrangement, it's typically only meant to be done on a temporary basis. As you can understand, like there's 
often some scenarios that weren't uh, considered that may come up, you know, sometimes there's arguments about groceries and, you know, keeping the home cleanly. Um, in collaborative matters, I've also had um, some unique situations where we've uh, negotiated agreements that included terms for a delayed sale or um, payments for a buyout that are sort of um, uh, paid over a period of time. Um, so that's also some consideration. Even when talking about looking at the potential scenarios for a matrimonial home, we have to look at who owns the home. Um, sometimes it could be where it's joint owners. Um, and there's some different differentiations within uh, with there's joint tenants or tenants in common with joint tenants, which is what often people do with estate planning. There's a rate of survivorship. So there's also that consideration uh, when there's a separation. Sometimes um, I have parties uh, come in where they think about severing that joint tenancy, which just means that if they were to pass away, the, the, the property doesn't pass on to the uh, surviving spouse. And, and even if the separation issues had not been resolved. Children always keep them at the forefront. Um, if your scenario is with the home, you might want to consider when you're selling, you may want to delay that until the end of the school year. You also look at considerations if there's a domestic contract. In cohabitation agreements or marriage contracts, you'll often see clauses built into them that might have scenarios with respect to the matrimonial homes. Often you'll see where one party has the option to uh, purchase the other's interest first there's sort of some sort of mechanism and how they would determine the value of the matrimonial home in terms of for the uh, buyout. Um, also with the market shifting, obviously market conditions are very important. And big factor is really who can afford the home. Um, so what I usually recommend is um, to try to approve approval uh, for a mortgage. Obviously now with the market shifting that has becoming more difficult, I'm seeing a lot of lenders not actually giving pre-approvals. So what I recommend usually is at the very least to do like the initial groundwork of an application just to get a ballpark figure to see how much one could qualify to see if it's even a possibility of uh, maintaining um, the matrimonial home on their own. Great tips. Great tips. All right. Poll results. Um, do they each get half? 19% true, 8% false. Audience is catching on to our polls here. 73% says it depends. So this can be scary. What happens next? What do we need to know? Two minutes or less, Carolyn? Yeah, so I think the big thing to come into when, you know, one person recognizes that they want to separate, and we touched a little bit earlier, and is it's, it's a scary process because you get married, it takes two people, you know, you sign that marriage contract and you and you have that ceremony or whatnot, but it really does take just one person to proceed with the separation and showing that intent. So I think the big thing is, is um, <clears throat> writing out a plan. I have a lot of clients and they talk about journaling, and I think that's really important. Um, and in that process, writing out a plan is coming out with a financial plan. So this is a good time to review your financial circumstances, review your financial assets. It's also a good time to think about um, figuring out a way how to talk uh, to the kids. Um, it's a strong, like the literature says that um, you may not talk to the kids exactly when you have a plan, but the point is to try and do it together if possible. Um, I always recommend speaking with a social worker or some sort of um, psychological you know, therapist if necessary to give tips and pointers to make sure that the conversations that you have with the kids is, you know, first and foremost, age appropriate. And most important, I also say it's good to get um, get legal advice. You know, that might not mean retaining a lawyer right away, but it might mean uh, taking the step and having a consultation. When you have that consultation, it's really important to be prepared. You want to write out your questions, um, looking at the big picture. Like nobody imagines that they would go through this sort of process. Um, and I sort of align it to, you know, grieving in a sense, but if you look at it and think of writing out your goals and what your interests really are, um, that could, looking at it from a big picture perspective could be really helpful. Most important thing is to really try to keep the status quo in place. Now is not the time to, you know, cancel people off credit cards, close bank accounts, or change beneficiaries on your life insurance or, or your medical benefits, um, anything like that, it's not the time. We just recommend to keep everything status quo. Um, and unfortunately, what we the reality is, and as has been recognized in the act in the past years with those changes, is that domestic violence is a real issue. Um, and um, 
safety is priority. And if there is um, often recommendations to get um, that, you know, come up with a safety plan in place. Um, the literature is out there usually, uh, you know, when a spouse decides to separate, that is usually the most dangerous time for them at that period. Um, so it's very important to sort of reflect on, you know, the nature of the relationship and if necessary, come up with a safety plan. And there's tons of resources um, uh, available that are, uh, that can help with that. Um, and uh, again, just get that legal consultation because they'll, during that consult, you might give you uh, more information about like, deciding when, if and when it would be an appropriate time, if you decide that you do want to leave the matrimonial home. And if you need more information about a safety plan, you can contact your lawyer or one of us at our firm. We can give you more information on that. Writing out your goals and point form is really helpful, even before you go meet your lawyer, just so you have something you can refer back to. It could be overwhelming. You may forget what some of your goals are. Let's see what our audience thought of our last poll question. True or false, does the separation agreement it need to be drafted by a lawyer? 92% false. Um, so if it isn't drafted by a lawyer, it could be subject to two years of litigation, but it's not necessary. Kitchen table agreements and disclosure. That's a nice lead into our next topic. Annie, one or two minutes. What do we need to know? Okay. So what you need to know is that a separation agreement uh, is a domestic contract and it it can potentially be set aside by a court in the future if one of the parties makes an application to the court seeking to have it set aside. And that is why, uh, while a kitchen table agreement, uh, provided that it is in writing, it's signed and it's witnessed, is valid, it is not necessarily advisable. So I always tell people you want to do two things. You want to make sure that the other party gets a lawyer. You Unfortunately, you, you know, you can't compel the other side to do so. And a lot of times people come to me and say, my, you know, my wife or my husband is refusing to get a lawyer. And I say, well, we can't force them to, but I want to be on the record as telling you that this is the danger then for you. Because if somebody does not have a lawyer who will sign ILA, which stands for independent legal advice, attesting to the fact that the uh, signatory to the agreement understood or had explained to him or her what he or she was agreeing to, understood his or her rights, and crucially was not acting under duress, was not acting under fear of compulsion of the other person. That leaves the door open in the future to a party uh, filing an application to the court to have the agreement set aside side on those grounds. Now, we don't have enough time to get into the nitty gritty of how a contract can be set aside by the courts. But if your spouse has a lawyer, that's a good way to uh, foreclose on those arguments, to prevent them from being able to say in the future, well, I'm, I, I'm just a lay person. I'm a stay at home wife. I didn't go to law school. I didn't understand what I was signing on to. Well, no, you had a lawyer and that lawyer signed a certificate stating that you did, in fact, understand what you were signing on to. The other element is disclosure. And it's another thing that I find that clients often try to contract out of or negotiate their way out of because it's such a pain to do. It's time consuming. It's annoying. You have to run around to the bank. You have to get bank statements. You have to get printouts. Nobody wants to do it. But again, under the uh, Family Law Act in Section 56 sub 4, a domestic contract can be set aside if a party did not make full and frank financial disclosure of assets and debts that they had. And so it is essential when people say, oh, I know my wife has nothing. We have a couple of bank accounts. She doesn't really have anything or vice versa. Does it matter? Has to get done. I tell people absolutely do not enter into an agreement without full and frank financial disclosure. And again, that's another reason that you'd want a lawyer to help you with the agreement is because they'll know what to ask for. The things that don't occur to people, like the disposition costs to apply to an RSP or a pension, the way to value home. There are lots of things that come up that don't, you know, like I said earlier, there's such an intersection between family law and other areas of law, tax law, you know, um, survivorship, et cetera. All these things need to be addressed in an agreement. And you're going to miss some of these pieces of the puzzle if you are, you know, two lay people creating a legal contract as opposed to having a lawyer do it. Great, great stuff. Quick tip, uh, Carolyn, 30 seconds or less, what we need to know. 
Yeah, really fast. Um, if you're working with a lawyer, my biggest recommendation would be is to communicate. Well, sorry, advise your lawyer what your communication style is. So whether you like email or you like telephone call, I think that's really important. If you're email type of person, I recommend um, writing out, uh, you know, very detailed emails. I like lists. I like bullets. Um, sometimes that's really easy for your lawyer to communicate with you. Um, in terms of if you're in court and you're self-represented, that is a challenge. I would recommend getting what we call unbundled services, um, sort of like a pay as you go. And you basically would um, get legal advice as you need it. Um, and you would pay um, obviously like a smaller amount of retainer than you would um, if you had fully someone representing you. There's tons of resources on our website. Like we have tons of podcasts with the archive and blog. So those are really useful tools, tools as well to get some more information. Obviously it's not legal advice, but it is definitely a good starting point um, for some of the topics that you might need more information on. Counseling services, we're not counselors, but we have a duty to inform our clients that these services are available and these are new. Also, the Divorce Act requires us. Consider marriage counseling is always an option. Not every relationship needs to end with a divorce. Individual counseling, if you're having trouble, family counseling, counseling for the children. You can get a voice of the child report to get the wishes uh, and preferences of the child if they want a under, better understanding as to where they want to live. Something to keep in mind, and that brings us to Q&A, and we've got two minutes left for our host to bring us into the station. Thank you. I just want to thank all of our speakers today. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge on the panel today, and just want to thank all of our audience for your participation and for your questions. We've had an overwhelming amount come in, so um, I know that a lot have been addressed throughout the presentation, so I hope a lot of your questions were answered. Um, we, it looks like we have time maybe for one more. Russ, I know you just mentioned um, voice of the child. I just had a question here. Um, how do you demonstrate the best interests of the child if you want to expand on that anymore? Yeah, anybody want to take that one quickly? Carolyn, I see you nodding your head or Annie. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, I think the big thing is, is in terms of voice of the child, there are um, private practitioners, or if you're in the court proceeding, you can have an office of the children's lawyer appointed. And what they can do is to, um, you know, meet with the children. And the key thing is to make sure that what they're saying is consistent and to make sure that they're not being influenced by either parent um, in, in terms of expressing what they would like. And it's important to realize that it's not like the BN and all, all of getting a voice of the child report or getting the children's views and preferences. It's just one of the considerations that are made in determining what is appropriate um, for what is considered the best interest of the child. All right, it's one o'clock, amazing. Thank you, Carolyn. And thanks again to all of our speakers and to our audience. We appreciate you joining us over the last hour to hear our panelists share their insights on family law matters. And we hope we have the pleasure of hosting you again soon. Our next virtual event will be on Wednesday, January 18th at noon with a presentation on international abductions and the Hague Convention. We'll be providing you with registration information and additional resources in an email to all of our registrants tomorrow. I'd also like to note that on our virtual events page, there is a speaker application form for anyone who is interested in applying to be a panelist for upcoming virtual events. We always love to have new guest speakers join us. So if you have any ideas, please uh, feel free to submit that. I'll also include that in our email going out tomorrow. And we'd uh, love to hear ideas for future presentations. As I mentioned earlier, there will be a survey that pops up following the webinar once we log off. So um, there is a section to include ideas for topics in there and provide us with feedback. So again, we very much welcome everyone's feedback. Um, and if you do have any uh, general questions or comments about our virtual events, you can email me at shannon at russellalexander.com and I'll be happy to help. And we'd like to just extend our gratitude once again to all of our audience and we hope you have a great day. Great job, everybody. Thank you for your time today. Thanks so much, everyone.